On behalf of the board and staff of the Marine Interfaith Council, welcome to the 22nd Annual Prayer Breakfast. My name is Reverend Scott Quinn, Executive Director of the Marine Interfaith Council. It is my joy to welcome each of you. Wherever you are, wherever you come from, whatever you believe, whoever you love, we are so glad you are here this morning as we celebrate the National Day of Prayer, which is observed nationally on the first Thursday in May. Here in Marin, the land of the coastal Miwok people, we celebrate a few days early. And while in some places this is purely a Christian observance, we are happy to acknowledge people of every faith and those of no prescribed faith, as together we create a safe, respectful place for a diversity of people and perspectives. So this is all the more essential as we come together during this global pandemic and affirm that we are one humanity, one shared life. So it's in that spirit that we gather online for this prayer breakfast. And if you have a prayer, if you have a breakfast with you or not, if you're dressed for the day or still in your jammies, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. And so before we begin, just a couple of Zoom reminders. Uh, first of all, on the very top of your Zoom screen, you have an option of either being in gallery view or speaker view. So gallery view, you can view all the beautiful faces gathered here today. Speaker view will automatically show on your screen whoever is speaking. And then in the bottom of your Zoom window is a mute button and a video button. So we invite you, if you so choose, to click the video button so um, we can see your lovely face with us today. Um, we'll begin with everyone on mute and um, to stay in mute at the end, we'll have a chance for some small groups, some breakout rooms in which you'll be unmuted. Um, but this is so we won't be distracted by the background noises in each other's homes. And then also in the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, your Zoom window is a chat button. And if you click on the chat, um, a panel is going to appear on the right hand side. And over there is where you'll have the opportunity to type in a message that will go to everyone. And we'll use that in just a minute to introduce ourselves. You can also share it, use it to share noticings during our time together, or you can also um, ask for any technical help. Um, so again, that'll be for your chat function. And I'm putting in the chat right now, um, just a link if anybody feels so call today to make an additional donation to Marine Faith Council. I put the link into the chat window. Thanks to all of you who already did. We're so grateful to you. That's how we continue to exist. Thank you for your support. And so what I'd like you to do right now, if you would like, is in the chat to use that to introduce yourself. Um, please share your name. If you're affiliated with a faith community or organization, uh, share that too, or simply where you live. So if everyone just take a moment or two in chat, and name, faith community organization, and where you're joining us from. Um, and we'll just take a look to see who all is here by using the chat feature. Such a joy to see all of you here with us today. And we're gonna begin with an invocation that will be offered by Dr. Laley First, who is with the International Association of Sufism and is also an MIC board member and our immediate past, uh, well, and be a former board president. And so we're very excited to have Laley with us today to offer our invocation.
Thank you, Scott. I think everyone can hear me now. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's so nice to see so many beautiful faces here on this day to celebrate prayer. So we pray for ourselves, for each other, and for the whole of humanity. So where do we go from here? This is definitely a time of challenge and opportunity. And I'm really looking forward to hearing each of our speakers to hear ideas that we all have and can share. When I thought about this topic as the, the theme for today, I remembered a talk at the opening of one of the International Association of Sufism, Sufism Symposium, back in May of 2007. And the theme that year was Sufism and the World Crisis. It resonates still today. Are we constantly in a state of crisis? So I'd like to share part of that opening with you today. These are the words of Dr. Nahid Anga, who is co-founder and co-director of International Association of Sufism. As the story tells us and history confirms, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Such is perhaps the case of any given time. The world of this present time is a combination of fortunate and misfortunate joyous and miserable, war and peace, and the time when wealth and poverty hand in hand consume the people. Perhaps this has been the situation of the world all along. But now, rather than reading the significance and effects of these stories in books of history and wondering if they relate to us or not, we are at the receiving end of history, creating a road ahead. We are experiencing what past generations have experienced through time, the best of times and the worst of times. We now receive, we host, we embrace, we offer and we disseminate these stories to the next generation. This is what leads our human family to its misfortune or fortune, to its war or peace, to its mourning or celebration. The present time is history in its finest creation and in its truest form. As spiritual people, we honor and revere humanity and all creation. And we see the face of the divine in every aspect of life. Life deserves to be respected and honored. And life is given to all creation by the creator, regardless of nationality, culture, era of time, gender, or religion. The most dedicated among the deserving servants of God are those who are good to their human family, regardless of nationality, cultures, gender, or religion. When our reverence for life is diminished, when our greed for having more shadows our compassion and honor for life, when our technology dictates human destiny, when our hunger for excess and our thirst for power cannot be satisfied, when human beings are left alone to their mournful destiny, our world falls into crisis. When we forget to honor our home, the earth, and ignore the warnings of natural disasters, our world falls into crisis. History will judge whether or not we were the contributors to our misfortune or fortune, as what remains will be an indication of our dedication to destruction or construction. We are witnessing the world that is heading towards global warming, a world that is experiencing war in every corner, a world where everyone blames somebody else for the disaster ahead, and no one takes a truest form of responsibility. However, whether we admit it or not, we know that we are all responsible and accountable for our well being, for the well being of our society, and the well being 
of the entire human family and the creation. I'd like to close with these words of wisdom from Dr. Unger. The spiritual traditions of the world have not lost hope in human beings. And they remind us again and again of the importance of understanding and honoring the universe within the human heart. This universe opens the door of understanding, free from the dimensions of time or place, gender or race, cultures or traditions, and all that is fleeting in human life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laylee. And an additional thank you just publicly for being an amazing board member, part of our executive team, our past board president. So due to term limitations, Laylee has to uh, leave our board next month, but we are immensely grateful to you, most of all for your loving presence among us. Thank you so much, Laylee. So our theme today, which Laylee mentioned is, where do we go from here? After over a year of pandemic, climate chaos, racial injustice, political volatility, where do we find our inspiration and direction? We explore this question through the lens of the faith journeys of our three speakers today who will offer nourishment and wisdom for the journey ahead of us. And just a moment to acknowledge some of my sources of wisdom and nourishment, including some of the amazing people who are here with us today. Feel free to wave your hand in your Zoom room just when I mention you. Um, any of our MIC board of directors uh, with us today? All of our donors, anyone who's a donor to MIC or supporters, um, thank you again so very much. Our foundation supporters, San Francisco Foundation, Silicon Valley Foundation, and deepest gratitude to Marin Community Foundation. And to my uh, amazing coworkers, Janice Ennick and Lynn Oldham Robinette. That's the beauty of the Marin Interfaith Council is really the people. It's you, you are the Marin Interfaith Council. Officially, it was founded in 1982 as a respectful collaborative with a threefold mission, celebrate faith, advocate justice, build community. We do that in a lot of ways. Uh, one way is our Love, Lose, and Marin initiative, which counters hate and bias with a campaign that promotes radical inclusion. MIC promotes wholeness through a monthly meditation featuring spiritual practices from a different faith leader each month. We organize faith communities to support immigrant families. We have several ongoing discussion groups that offer brave space in which we can grow, learn from, support, and be transformed by each other. These groups address topics like racial justice, climate change, and the intersection of spirituality and social action. We also advocate for systemic change on issues like housing, homelessness, mental health, the needs of older adults, education equity, and climate change. And these are just a few examples of the work of the Marin Interfaith Council, which is our collective work together. So again, we thank you for your support. For more information and to sign up for our twice monthly e-newsletter, go to marinifc.org. Our vision is a world where everyone thrives and is welcome in their full humanity, where our presence as people of open heart and deep spirit changes public discourse, changes hearts and minds, changes policies and structures. So thank you for living that vision with us this morning. So as part of that vision today, we hold this prayer breakfast, at which we'll hear three distinct perspectives. I invite you to open your hearts and minds to receive what is familiar and comforting and to hold with gentle curiosity what is new or unfamiliar or that you may not agree with. And if anything you hear leads to maybe a little tightness in your chest or shoulders or stomach, that's normal. It's our human way of processing the unfamiliar. Simply notice it, be kind with yourself and each other as we hold everything today with compassion and openness. So we're blessed today to have three amazing speakers, Reverend Anita Adesanya of Allen Temple Baptist Church and the Chaplaincy Institute, 
Rabbi Paul Steinberg from Congregation Kol Shapar, and Sylvia Borstein from Spirit Rock Meditation Center. I'll introduce each speaker, and after we've heard from all three of them, then we'll have a chance for you to grow into some small groups, some Zoom breakout rooms, where we can discuss what stirred within us as we listened. So our first speaker I'm very excited about, not only because um, just because of who she is and the many ways that she moves in this world, but also I have the joy and privilege of getting to work with her and she's an absolute delight. Um, Reverend Anita Pearl Adesanya, who serves as Associate Minister of Spiritual Life for the Allen Temple Baptist Church and is president and CEO for the Interfaith Chaplaincy Institute. In addition, she provides regular spiritual care, instruction and supervision to students at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary and San Francisco Theological Seminary. Her theology of ministry to assist and uplift others through knowledge, encouragement, and spiritual guidance is really to make the world better by using her spiritual gifts to help others live more abundantly and to experience truth, joy, and justice by surrendering all to the spirit. With an inner conviction that spirituality and justice go hand in hand, the goal of her ministry is to communicate the ideals of her Christian faith, enabling others to mature, become spiritually healthy, and follow Christ in providing and advocating for those who are oppressed and marginalized. She subscribes to Christ's greatest command to love unconditionally. And in that light, she opens her ministry wide, ecumenically and interreligiously to love and to serve all. She's a highly sought after pastoral counselor and spiritual director, earned her master's of divinity and spiritual direction diploma at San Francisco Theological Seminary and an MA in Religion and Psychology at Graduate Theological Union, where she is currently earning a PhD. She also holds a BA in Architecture from University of California at Berkeley and worked in land development and construction industries for 25 years. She's the editor and co-author of Kaleidoscope, Broadening the Palette and the Art of Spiritual Direction, and has been selected to receive the 2021 Luke Mowbray Award, the highest ecumenical and interfaith honor given by the American Baptist Churches USA. You can discover more about her at wjoy.org. So it's my joy and privilege to welcome uh, Reverend Anita with us today. Thank you so much for being with us and welcome. Thank you so very much, Scott. And greetings, everyone. I want to share with you a song. And so please receive these words of my, one of my favorite artists in the RE. Enjoy it as well. Live their life. The Muhammad, Krishna, or the Buddha are the way. Still, some believe it's right to say the name of Jesus when you pray. We are a human kind of seven billion. So many different races and religions, and it all comes down to one. Some say God's a hymn. Still many believe that he is a her. Does God live in our hearts? Or is she somewhere? There in the universe, we are a human kind of seven billion. So many different races and religions, and it all comes down to one. How far will we have to go before we learn the lesson? Gandhi was a Hindu, Martin Luther King, a Christian. Callous of religion, they knew love was the mission. And it all comes down to one. Is there no 
So millions live their lives that Muhammad, Krishna, or the Buddha are the way. Still, some believe it's right to say in the name of Jesus when we pray. We are a humankind of seven billion, so many different races and religions. And we all want the same thing it all comes down to one. India says, how far will we have to go before we learn the lesson? Gandhi was a Hindu, Martin Luther King, a Christian. Regardless of religion, they knew love was the mission. Grand Rising, Marin Interfaith Council Community and Friends. Grand Rising is the term my son, my 30 year old son taught me maybe a couple of months ago. He said, don't say good morning anymore, mom, say grand rising. And so grand rising to you all. I am so pleased to share this time and this virtual space with you. Thank you for inviting me. I began with the words of India Ari from her track called One, I put it in the chat because I wanna speak with you briefly about that which brings us together, that which must guide us into the future if we are to truly have a future. You may have read in my bio, or well, you've heard now, that um, I've been selected to receive the Luke Malbury Ecumenical Award from the American Baptist Churches of the USA. And this is an annual honor given, given to recognize one who has extensive or sustained work in the cause of ecumenical and interfaith service. And I was ever so grateful for the nomination, but completely humbled, completely humbled that my denomination would select me to recognize me for my efforts simply to love my neighbor. I bring you greetings from the Allen Temple Baptist Church in Oakland, California, where I serve as the Associate Minister of Spiritual Life. My pastor there is the Reverend Dr. Jacqueline A. Thompson. Allen Temple is an historic African-American congregation founded more than 100 years ago. We are a community of people committed to love and social justice as modeled for us by Jesus the Christ through proclamation, contemplation, yes, and action. In the largely gruesome year of 2020, Allen Temple has continued to serve those in need uh, from providing food regularly, uh, financial assistance, tens of thousands of dollars to keep water and electricity running for those who are in need, to providing accessible, 
and consistent COVID-19 testing and ongoing vaccinations. Our mission calls for us to extend the high moral message of God's love throughout the world. I also bring you greetings from the Chaplaincy Institute, an interfaith seminary and community who we affectionately refer to as Chi. At Chi, I serve as Scott uh, introduced me as president and CEO of the board of directors currently. Grounded in the work of broad spiritual care for more than two decades, Chi, I think, is an elder in the growing movement in interfaith education and spiritual formation. A sister organization to Marin Interfaith Council, Chi is predominantly Eurocentric in her makeup. In recent years, we have adopted a deep culture, deep culture, you'll hear more about it. It's an initiative to seek and embrace that and those who are underrepresented at Chi. With that trajectory in mind, Chi has and continues to send forth hundreds of interfaith and interspiritual chaplains, ministers, and spiritual directors who provide care for people, animals, and nature, all living beings. Honoring the sacred connection of all, Chi envisions a world transformed, a world healed and whole. Two vastly different entities, yet with at least one thing in common. They each serve as one of my spheres of influence. Prior to my call to ministry and the religious academy, you've heard as well, I forgot it was in my bio, that I worked in land development. I was in, uh, uh, a land developer and construction manager uh, and designer. One of my long-term clients was the Alameda Local Agency Formation Commission, also known as LAFCO. Some of you may have had interactions with a LAFCO in your county. LAFCO oversees local governments to balance the preservation of uh, agriculture and open space with the provision of sustainable municipal services. One of LAFCO's primary functions is to manage the boundaries of these agencies, cities, water districts, utility districts, and the like. Of significance in managing those boundaries are the spheres of influence of each local agency. Boundaries have a tendency to bleed. Actions taken within the boundaries of one agency could create residual impacts well beyond its boundaries. In other words, each action presented the consequence or the opportunity to influence a much broader sphere. And here's my close. In response to the inquiry, where do we go from here? We must each begin one sphere at a time to implement our individual gifts towards collective and far-reaching sustainable change. These must be gifts and actions that would bend the moral arc of our nation in love toward justice and liberation for all, right? We all have gifts. And so I have two questions for you. First is, what are your gifts? And I invite you to write them in the chat now. And, you know, just give one or two because we all have many gifts. Maybe, maybe you um, are a knitter and you can knit some, a sweater for someone. Maybe you have the gift of gab and you can speak and on behalf of those who aren't so articulate. Maybe, um, you have a facility or a home that you can open up. Maybe you have funds to, 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 to help an organization who's struggling to do the right thing, to love, listening. That's maybe the, the, the number one gift in my, in my life is that of listening, compassion, organizing. We all have spheres of influence also through which our gifts can bleed. 
Our families at the dinner table, that's a sphere of influence. Our places of work, our spaces and communities of worship, our nonprofit organizations that we support, our social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you use. I don't think there's many people, I, there are some, I know a couple who don't engage in some form, LinkedIn, of social media. Our pandemic bubbles, you've got some spheres of influence. And so what are your spheres of influence is my second question. Think about it and share those with us in the chat. I know my Instagrammer. <laughs> We are a humankind of seven billion, so many different races and religions, and we all want the same things, health, love, prosperity, and peace. Tolerance is the seed, and the gift of pure acceptance is the tree, says India. Whether you are red, brown, yellow, black, or white, a man with a husband or a woman with a wife, we can debate until the end of time who's wrong and who's right. But we can see ourselves as one because it all comes down to love. Words of India Ari. Peace and blessings to you all. Thank you so much, Reverend Anita. Thank you for this grand rising that you have blessed us with this morning. Uh, we're so grateful for you. Well, we continue prompted and um, uplifted by um, Reverend Anita's message this morning. And we bring our loving attention now to uh, rabbi Paul Steinberg, who is our second speaker. Paul Steinberg is a rabbi and nationally recognized transformative educator. He previously served um, before his current uh, position at Congregation Kol Shafar in Tiburon. He was principal of a Jewish day school in Dallas, Texas, the senior educator at uh, Valley Beth Shalom in Encino, California, and the community rabbi at uh, Beth Teshuvah, in Los Angeles. And while in these positions, he simultaneously served on local and national boards, as well as taught Jewish philosophy in the Graduate School of Education at the American Jewish University. Rabbi Steinberg himself holds two bachelor's degrees, three postgraduate degrees, and is currently completing his doctorate in education at the Jewish Theological Seminary. He's published many articles on Jewish thought and education, as well as six books including A Steady Guide to Jewish Ethics Recovery, The 12 Steps, and Jewish Spirituality, Reclaiming Hope, Courage, and Wholeness, and the three-volume series Celebrating the Jewish Year, which earned the National Jewish Book Award. His most recent book, Spiritual Growth, A Contemporary Jewish Approach, represents an accessible approach to dealing with the challenges of the day through Jewish spiritual ideals and practice. As I mentioned, uh, Rabbi Steinberg currently serves at Congregation Kol Shabar in Tiburon, but he's a native of Tucson, Arizona, and is the father of three daughters. And it is our deep joy and privilege to uh, welcome our friend, uh, Rabbi Paul Steinberg. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for this opportunity. It's really an honor to be able to share um, some thoughts with you all this morning and, uh, and on this very challenging theme. I want to recognize my colleague, Rabbi Susan Leiter from Congregation Kol Shofar, who's also here with us today. Um, and also just to say what an honor it is to, to, to be able to share this with my fellow presenters, Reverend Anita and Sylvia. Um, great to, I look forward to hearing from you as well. So in Judaism, at the center of the Jewish tradition, is the Torah, the five books of Moses. At the center of those five books is, well, the third book, which is the book of Leviticus. 
And right at the center, right about at the center of Leviticus, we arrive at the single strangest and most difficult Torah portion beginning in chapter 12. So I don't know if you know this, in Judaism, the Torah portions are named for their first significant word. And in this case, it's named Tazria, which literally means the inseminated woman. Okay, a significant work, all right? And so when I say that this is a difficult Torah portion, what I mean is try talking to a 13-year-old bar mitzvah boy about his Torah portion when he's been assigned the one that literally means an inseminated woman, okay? Oy vav voy. Beyond the title though, what we read there in the center of the Torah is strange. It's ancient, it feels primitive, and in many ways it's disturbing. It's all about skin disease and bodily fluids and menstruation. Basically for the rabbi, it's a good Torah portion to speak on just about anything else that week. I bring all this up because of the entire Torah, it's perhaps in this central, most challenging and strange Torah portion that there is in fact a concept that is appropriate for this morning and our theme, which I'd like to explore a little bit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> See, the key to understanding this ancient view of the body and its fluids and ultimately its relationship to the spirit are two words in the Torah that I believe are useful here. They are, in Hebrew, tahor and tameh. Tahor and tameh. Let's start with tahor. If a person is tahor, they are eligible to participate in the collective worship of the community. And the collective form of worship in biblical times was what? a sacrifice. So if you are Tahor, you can bring a Passover sacrifice on Passover. If you're Tahor, you can bring a Thanksgiving offering if someone from your family recovered from a disease. If you're Tahor, you can bring a sin offering if you did something wrong and wanted to atone for it. Or an Asham, a guilt offering, if you really did something wrong and wanted to atone for it. Got it? So in sum, if you're Tahor, you can participate in the sacrificial worship of the community. If you're Tameh, you're ineligible. You cannot participate. You're not allowed, even if you're the priest, even if you're the high priest. Tahor, Tameh. You have the idea, you have the word. Now, sometimes Tahor is translated as pure and Tameh is impure, but that's a terrible translation. And I'll show you why. Because at the outset, you have to understand what makes you tameh, what makes you ineligible. Tahor, again, is the ordinary condition. It's the normative condition. We're all tahor until you become tameh. And what makes you tameh? Well, what makes you tameh is some kind of bodily discharge. See, the ancient world had this taboo, which was that things that are in the body should stay in the body, and that things outside the body should stay outside the body. There's a barrier between the body and the world. And if someone crosses that barrier, if a woman has her menstrual period, for example, that makes her tame. If a woman gives birth to a baby, she becomes tame. If a man has an emission, he becomes tame. I know, by the way, that this is not what you came here at nine o'clock in the morning for, right? I realize that this is, but, but, wait, there's more, okay? And this is where it gets complicated. Also, if you come into contact with dead things, so if you trip over a dead body walking somewhere, I suppose, that makes you tame. You can also become tame by touching a certain kind of lizard called a sheritz. Okay. The problem with all of this, however, is that it's not just bodily emissions and not consistent. So for example, if you blow your nose, that doesn't make you tame. How come that emission doesn't count when that emission does count? Or here's another problem. How come moments that should be sanctified like the birth of a baby, how come that makes you tame? And if you really wanna get confused in the post-biblical world of the rabbinic sages, they made a rule where if you touch a scroll of the Torah itself, you become tame. And finally, finally, I promise, finally, if you're tame, how can you be prohibited to participate in sacrificial worship, which involves the slaughter and blood and touching of an animal? You see why this is such a pain to write a sermon on? But what you start to realize about these terms, tahor and tameh, is that it's not 
really about pure and impure. It's not about clean and unclean. It's not even about bodily emissions. It's about something much deeper, something which all of us understand, even as odd as all of this may seem to us today. It's about touching the bounds that separate life from death. It's about straddling the edges of human experience. A, par a person who participates in the birth of a child becomes Tame. A person who participates in burying a loved one becomes Tame. A person who has been ill, but I mean really ill, okay? Colds don't count. You become Tame. Why? Because something happens to you when you brush against the perimeters of existence. Ask young couples, what's a moment in your life that you marveled at with awe? Watching the birth of my kid. Ask those who are aging and ask them, what's a moment that you've marveled at with awe? Bearing my parents and loved ones. And if anyone has been ill, seriously ill, and I include in that matters of mental health, various forms of depression and addiction, as that's been a part of my personal experience. In other words, if you've stood at the gates of death in one way or another and took a good look over on the other side, you're not the same person anymore. These rituals, these ritual concepts of tahor and tameh are not about purity and impurity or clean and unclean. These biblical concepts represent a line that bisects humanity. On one side of the line are all the people in the world who have never been in touch with the boundaries of existence itself. It's the people who can live in the world of ordinary experiences and take those experiences and themselves way too seriously. The kind of people that think that dancing with the stars is really important. The kind of people who get inordinately angry at the long line at the bank. People who threaten fistfights because of a traffic jam the kind of people who curse at the weather, especially here in Marin, those kind of people, okay? And on the other side of the line are all the people who have been touched, perhaps by birth, either the arrival of a child or with the experiences of infertility, the struggle with IVF, a miscarriage. And there's people who've been touched by death, who stood at the graveside and looked down into the grave people who held the hand of someone dying or someone terribly sick, or who have themselves been gravely ill, or God forbid, harmed, and feel blessed now to be counted as a survivor. Because when you've been touched, you come to understand that life is terribly fragile, terribly, terribly fragile. And that reality is so hard to accept that most of us wanna cover it up. We're expert at denying it. But many of us still walk around with it all the time. We know it. We know it in our kishkas, as my grandma would say. And after all, what does the Torah say about the tameh, the exposed person, the touched one? It says that you don't need to sacrifice. In other words, when you've been touched and are deemed tameh, you already know the truth about what it means to be a human and being. You already know where God enters the world. You already know how to say thank you for the gifts of a day when you're not in pain and the gift of a day when you can be together with loved ones and friends and the gift of a day when the sun rises to offer yet another opportunity of possibility. The simple gift of another day. When you've been touched like that, you know how precious another day in the world is. So you don't need sacrifice to teach you that. Sacrifice was set up for all the other people who need to be reminded from time to time what life is really about, how thankful we are for another single day that we have together, a day of health, a day of being relatively pain-free, a day of hope. That's what Tameh and Tahor really mean. When we look back at the strange aspects in the Torah, now it starts to make sense. So what does this have to do with us today? Well, because we've all just crossed the line. Because the entire culture, all of America, all the world now understands. Because each and every one of us knows someone who sat in a hospital or wherever, trembling, waiting for the results of a COVID test. 
And too many of us know friends who died alone in the ICU holding the hand of a nurse who was wearing three layers of PPE. And all of us know that up until about March 18th, 2020, all of this that we've gone through was just theoretical. And on March 19th, the entire world came crashing down. Now we all know it. So now comes a great Jewish wisdom. How can we can ask, how do you live now that we're all Tame, that we're all touched by the liminalities of life and death? The Jewish tradition teaches that every, each and every day one is supposed to recite a hundred blessings. Hundred blessings every day. Why should we say a hundred blessings every day? Well, you might say that it's to cultivate gratitude, but that's not what the rabbinic sages say. They say we need a hundred blessings to cultivate another Hebrew word here. Simcha, simcha loosely means joy. Unfortunately, especially in our American culture, there's a confusion about the word joy because it's all too often confused with happiness. In America, we say it's about the pursuit of happiness. But for me, from a spiritual perspective, it's the cultivation of joy. Happiness is not joy. Happiness is associated with the fortune of the moment, that which happens to you. What's happenstance? It's good luck, good fun, and often from something external. Joy, on the other hand, is an embrace of life for life's sake, not despite it, but because of life's fragility. It comes from a growing sense of well-being and connection, meaning, and purpose. Joy is an awareness, even amidst the inherent and inevitable heartbreaks of the world. It's an awareness, a reverence, really, for life inside of you, which is both affirming and being affirmed by all the life that surrounds you. It happens consciously or unconsciously at a sound of music, the breeze or sunshine on your skin, someone's smile, the sweet voice of a child. When you experience that joy, not happiness, but real joy, a joy that can simultaneously hold the space for pain, but is still undiminished by it. When you know that, well, that long line at the bank ain't that bad. When you're cut off in traffic, rather than me fantasizing about what I'd like to say to the son of a gun, I can say, thank God I'm not in that kind of a hurry. The frozen kosher chicken at Trader Joe's can wait another minute till I get there, all right? Let him just be safe. When you say a hundred blessings a day, the tradition likes to think that the odds will be stacked up so when the frustrating, maddening, and painful parts come, that you'll have enough in your reserves of spiritual defense of gratitude, yes, but ultimately joy, reverence for life that will comfort you. This past year, we did a lot of grieving, grieving the losses that came from isolation, missing milestone events, grieving the loss of financial stability and the enormous loss of life itself. Of course, this is all amidst the grieving over the painful political and social divisions. But grieving is where we came from. And Kierkegaard, the great existentialist said, it takes moral courage to grieve. It takes religious courage to rejoice. In other words, it takes spiritual fortitude to experience joy, genuine joy. And I'll just end here. Like many clergy, I can imagine, I've been asked over and over and over during the last six months, how will we be different when things return to normal, when we reopen? And I tell you how I pray I will be and how we all will be. I pray that we can live the life of the Tame, the life of someone who appreciates the gifts of life, to squeeze as much life out of every single moment we can, to cultivate joy. It will be a joy to come back to our spaces of prayer and study. What a joy to be able to hug friends. What a joy to sing together again. Joy to learn and share stories, to break bread together. If there's anything that this bizarre year does for us, please, God, let it be that. Let it open our eyes to what really means to celebrate the joys of life. Appreciate how precious, how precious, how precious they really are. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Rabbi Paul, for grounding us in this deep joy 
that is able to hold all of life's fragility. Um, we're so grateful to you. Thank you. So we have been blessed by our first two speakers and now we have our third and final speaker. It's our joy and honor to welcome Sylvia Borstein. She has been teaching Dharma and mindfulness meditation since 1985. She's a founding teacher at Spirit Rock Meditation Center, a psychotherapist. Um, she is particularly interested in emphasizing daily life as mindfulness practice and including informed citizenship and social activism is integral to spiritual maturation. Her books include, It's Easier Than You Think, The Buddhist Way to Happiness. Don't just do something, sit there, a mindfulness retreat. That's funny, you don't look Buddhist on being a faithful Jew and a passionate Buddhist. Pay attention for goodness sake, the Buddhist path of kindness. And happiness is an inside job practicing for a joyful life. And for more information, you can visit um, sylviaborstein.com and also audio recordings of her talks, visit dharmaseed.org. So it's a joy and honor to welcome you, Sylvia. Thank you so much for being with us today. I think you're still muted. There I am. Great. I'm very glad to be here this morning, and I'm I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to listen to Rabbi and Anita, and I'm Rabbi and listen to Rabbi, listen to listen to Rabbi Paul as well. And uh, uh, I'd like to start this morning with a meditation, coming from both of my previous speakers here this morning, picking up the theme that what everybody really wants is the same thing. We really want to live this precious life fully today, really appreciating what it means to be alive today in a world that's fragile and precious and, um, and contingent on so many, many things. Who knew that that virus was on its way? So this is a, a, a meditation based on a teaching from the Buddha. The teaching is called the Metta Sutta, the Sutta, the Sermon on, uh, uh, wait, wait, in, I love this word, the, the, the Sermon on Impartial Kindness. It's also called the Metta Sutta, M-E-T-T-A, and you can Google it. It's one page long. The significant lines in it are, may all beings be at ease. Whatever their living nature, whether they are near or far, known or unknown to us, born or to be born, May all beings be at ease. And it really is meant to come from one's own awareness of how, how deeply we all want for ourselves and our kin to be safe and well, to lie down in peace, to wake up in peace, to feel at ease. So the essence of these meditations, these particular meditations, is they take the form in modern time of the repetition of phrases and the repetition of phrases as you probably all know from prayer life is you say a thing over and over again and it habituates the mind it's hoped to habituate the mind in a particular direction so we'll do that for some minutes first and then i'll talk more about where do we go from here i'd like to invite you to sit in a comfortable way um, when I teach and there's a large group, especially on uh, Zoom where people are not sitting in, a, in, a com in community, I say to people, if your back hurts, you can lie down. You, it, that, the posture is not important to this. Sit in a comfortable way. And to begin with, if you're comfortable doing that, close your eyes. 
Just for a moment, listen to the room around you, which likely is quiet. Listen to the sound of silence really attentively. You're likely to find that when you put your attention in one particular sense organ, like the ears, just listening as intently as you can, that your whole body presents itself more clearly to you viscerally especially if your eyes are closed and there isn't an input through the eyes. It's likely that you feel your body, you know that you're sitting without your eyes open, just from where there's pressure on your bottom, where if you have a chair behind you or you're sitting on the sofa, you feel that. If nothing is touching your back, you feel that. You feel your arms alongside your body. You feel your breath coming in and out of your body. The magic thing about breathing is you don't need to remember to breathe. From the moment you're born to the last moment of your life, your body breathes itself in an extraordinary, miraculous way. I often suggest that people stop for a minute and notice it's a miracle. I woke up this morning and my body still is breathing on its own, and knows what to do. And if that makes happiness or joy arise in your mind or thanksgiving, See what happens if you smile a little bit, your body will relax a little bit more. It's a magic thing that smiling. It's like a message to your brain and your heart that they can relax, that you're safe. And here's the meditation. I'll say four phrases and I'll pause after I say it. And you say that phrase to yourself in your own mind I usually say them to myself silently, even if I'm alone. You can, of course, say them out loud. But here are the phrases. I'd like to invite you to feel the phrases in your body as you say them. May I feel protected and safe. May I feel contented and pleased. May my body, mind, spirit support me with grace. May my life unfold smoothly with ease. And again, say it, say it, and feel it as you say it. May I feel protected and safe. May I feel contented and pleased. May my body, mind, spirit support me with grace. May my life unfold smoothly with ease. Just once we'll try it without pronouns. Say to yourself, safe, and let it echo through your mind and body. Contented. Supported by grace. unfolding with ease. Think of the person, a person, 
that you dearly, dearly cherish and love. Perhaps your best beloved, perhaps a parent, perhaps a child, perhaps a sibling, all of the above, surely. Pick one of them for this moment and imagine them with you and imagine that you can bless them with this blessing. Imagine them in your mind's eye and in your heart say to them, may you feel protected and safe. May you feel contented and pleased. May your body, mind, spirit support you with grace. May your life unfold smoothly with ease. And just for a moment, let your mind send itself out around you to your whole family, to the people you pass in every day, past them, past all the people that you know in the world, to all the people that you don't know in the world, that get up in the morning and go to sleep at night and fall in love and have families and wish so much as we wish for the well-being of their people around them. Just for a moment, wish for all beings on this planet, on this earth, that care for each other. Wish for them, may all beings feel protected and safe. May all beings feel contented and pleased. May their body, mind, spirits support them with grace. May lives unfold smoothly with ease. I'll invite you as you open your eyes to look at the people in all their houses. I've stopped saying in all their boxes, everybody's in a house, everybody's in a place. Look at the people in all their places and just for a few moments, wish them all that they feel protected and safe, contented and pleased that their bodies and minds and spirits support them and that their lives unfold in a way that's filled with ease. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, how I thought about what I'd like to say this morning. I decided to interpret the, the uh, question about how do we go from here to how do I go from here uh, at this very particular moment in the history of my teaching and in my own life. I had with me, but I could not find it to show it to you this morning, a recent cartoon from a New Yorker. I, I wrote down that it was drawn by Kendra Allenby and it's a it's a it's a, a picture a drawing of two women in their apartment looking out over a cityscape and one of them is saying to the other i can't wait to forget everything i learned about myself during the pandemic and i'm going to use that i'm using that cartoon this morning and all this week and for a while 
well, as we're in this post-pandemic period, rejoining the world physically period, because I want to say just the opposite. I am saying I, I am hoping to actually remember what I learned about myself and about life for everyone and the fundamental truths I depend on. Those truths that became clearer to me, more clear than ever during this year of extra stress. I've been saying to people, I didn't learn any new truths this year, but I learned what I knew better. I'm using a new word actually. Uh, just the other day, I read a, um, I read, a, a, I'm reading a book by an activist, an activist academic named Camila Majid. She's one of the authors of Black and Buddhist, an anthology that's just been published, in which she uses the words blessing, the word blessings. She said it's a made up word that comes, it's an elited, elided form of blessing and lesson. And I'm using it to mean the lesson that I learned that feels like grace, really. I thought about the whole year, really, I thought about the whole world for the first time in history, sharing the same experience at the same time and knowing about it. The virulent and invisible virus that is most like the plague that any of us knew about, it, that I knew about all my life. And the thing that was different from plagues in the past was that the whole world was menaced by it at the same time. And mostly the whole world knew about it. And you all know that before those present times, wars have happened in parts of the world that other parts of the world didn't even know about. And other calamities happened that people were affected by, but not immediately. My grandfather's parents died in Austria months before my grandfather knew about it 100 years ago because letters came by boat and weeks, maybe months go by before they knew. And that was true of everyone in the world. So the impacts of losses were less mutual, less uh, group felt. The impact of the COVID virus and the threat of it was universally grievous and and threatening. The most grievous and threatening thing, I think, that the world world had, that we had ever known in our lifetimes. And I was really hoping it would be for the whole world a wake up call. I'm still hoping that it's going to be a wake up call. Everybody had said it before me this morning that we learn from it, let's do things differently. Listen, it's all fragile. And I'm thinking about all the religious traditions I know play about pray for peace for all beings. That particular phrase that, uh, uh, that uh, another particular phrase that comes out of that teaching about uh, impartial goodwill, impartial kindness, comes from a teaching that uh, gives the instruction that, uh, that you should say, that you should really hope for all the beings on the earth that they can also feel comfortable and ease, just as you would like it for yourself. And in Spirit Rock, we often use that phrase as a, as like a way of saying amen at the end of a prayer. When we ring a bell at the end of a sitting period or at the end of a teaching, we say, sometimes I'm afraid, to, I'm sorry to admit, sometimes rather perfunctorily, bing, ding, may all beings be peaceful and happy and come to the end of suffering. So you say it and you're not really behind it. And this year I had so many moments of saying, may all beings be peaceful and happy and come to the end of suffering and felt it in myself. I said, wow, this is the difference between saying something and praying it. And the important thing for me is in a moment of authentic connection with the truth of my heart, then I am enlivened. It's that sort of moment that uh, really recognizes the awesomeness of another moment of this precious life for myself, for the kin that are dear to me, people I know, and all the people who are suffering. May all beings be held. I thought a lot about impermanence, uh, again, about how poignant it is that everything keeps changing. The Buddha said that anybody who recognizes impermanence ceases to be contentious. That's my whole favorite line, I think, from the Buddha. Anyone who recognizes impermanence ceases to be contentious. When you realize 
this is not only this is the day the Lord has made, this is the only day that we have today. This is the only time we're going to have today. So I thought a lot about it and how poignant it is that everything keeps changing. That's that's the teaching of impermanence. Nothing to hold on to, nothing really that you can anticipate because things happen. But how precious life is. The world shared the universal threat of COVID, but at the same time, everybody's own particular life was unfolding. My husband Seymour, who I married 65 years ago, died three months ago. He died on February 4th. He died 18 months after he was diagnosed with non-smokers, small cell lung cancer. And for six months after his diagnosis, he was more or less okay. He had um, uh, medicine that kept the cancer from multiplying. And the COVID lockdown started just when the medicine stopped working. And so we had a year of a very simple life together with just our immediate family visiting. And his decline was slow, but visible week by week and then day by day at the end. And at the same time, our eldest grandson's wife was pregnant with their first child, our first great grandchild. And week by week, we could see that life growing in her. And Seymour wanted very much to see that child, his first great grandchild, and to hold it. And he got to do that. And that was a great event. And then he wanted to live long enough. Each time he'd say, I just want to see that child be born. Then he wanted to say, he said, I want to live long enough to get my ballot in the mail so I can vote. And he did that. And then he wanted to see how the election turned out. And he did that. And all the while he was weaker and weaker and really, you could see him moving out of this life. And then he died at home with his family around him, grateful for his life. And these days when I say the phrase, this precious love, human life, which is another phrase that the Buddha used frequently, I feel it differently than I did before. I feel like one of the enduring things that I learned more, the preciousness of life and the changingness of things all the time, have made me more patient and less irritable and more tolerant. Maybe that's the same thing over this year and more forgiving. I just mentioned to you the, the phrase from the Buddha, whoever understands impermanence ceases to be contentious. I think to myself, I would like to um, rephrase that as, wow, life is fragile and simultaneously precious, and we could treat it carefully. I'll tell you three, maybe two, very short vignettes of how that change manifests in me. Uh, one day I was sitting here at my uh, computer, and just when I was going to write something, the, uh, uh, the people next door on the other side of the driveway uh, have a, a gardener who comes every week and starts up the, the leaf blower and it starts vroom. And every, my, every experience with the leaf blower over the last several years has been the vroom. And my mind says there should be an ordinance against leaf blowing. It's such a polluter of, of uh, uh, the uh, air and it's a pollute, noise pollutant. And I should write to the board of supervisors and I hear vroom and I think, oh, good. That person still has a job. I'm so glad he's still working. I thought to myself, my mind is accidentally getting nicer than I am. I'm not even doing anything about it. My mind is skipping being annoyed. One day, it was the one day a week that the hospice nurse was supposed to come. And we got Seymour all showered and dressed and in his chair and waiting for her to come. And she called and said, I can't come today. I, I'm pulled away by somebody in more dire need. And my mind said, oh, good, go and be with that person. And it skipped the part that we were disappointed, not in but disappointed, skipped over it. Somebody else needs her more. And I thought to myself, really, my mind is, without my even making an effort, so settled down and so waked up by the preciousness of life that I am not making confused decisions. That's a wise decision. How good, go take care of that person. 
I'm thinking all of a sudden of the line from Psalms that says, purify my heart so I can truly serve. I want that to happen for me. I want my mind to only respond with goodwill. And it's doing it, I think, as a result of being confronted with impermanence and the preciousness of life in this intense way for a year. I think I'm living up to the phrase that started my meditation practice. I saw a sign in somebody's house that said, life is so difficult. How can I be anything but kind? And the person's house was a mindfulness teacher 45 years ago. And I thought, well, if that's what this leads to, that's what I'm gonna do. My great hope was that the world would emerge from this pandemic, revaluing life and abandoning conflict. I'm not sure that's happening, but maybe it will, and maybe it can. And maybe we as a community, not just here, but that stretches, I'm thinking more and more throughout the world, the community of people who hope and believe that the hoping is worthwhile will make a difference. I'm really glad to be able to tell you that today. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Sylvia, and for your beautiful message of our preciousness of life and our love and blessings to you uh, during this time and um, just honoring, remembering uh, your love, Seymour, and this impermanence and shift and for the beauty and the joy that you have brought to us today from your own life journey. Thank you. Thank you. So again, our deep thanks to um, Sylvia Borstein, to Rabbi Paul Steinberg, to Reverend Anita Adesanya. And so what we want to do now is just give you a few minutes, everybody who's here today, uh, to be in a small group and just chat for a few minutes about two things, and I'll put these in your small group. Um, what did you find particularly moving or interesting today? And what, if anything, was challenging or unfamiliar? So what did you find moving, interesting? What, if anything, was challenging or unfamiliar? So this is kind of part of a tradition of the prayer breakfast, have a chance to be with a couple other people and just talk about whatever is stirred up for you from your own open heart and open mind just to have fun for a few minutes of some conversation. All that you need to do when the invitation comes is to um, join the breakout room and then you'll be together with a few other people for a few minutes. Again, I'll put the questions as a prompt and then I'll also give you a prompt when it's time to, when we're almost out of time and we'll come back for a very brief close at the end. I hope that you had a wonderful conversation with your partners in the breakout room. Thank you so much to our three speakers, to Reverend Anita Adesanya, Rabbi Paul Steinberg, and Sylvia Borstein for your wisdom, your nourishment, your encouragement, giving us um, these beautiful reflections for our time together as we reflect on where do we go from here. A couple of uh, closing uh, thoughts and then one final closing uh, word. So just a reminder to go to marinifc.org to sign up for our newsletter, the upcoming events, uh, donate. Our next event will be a week from tomorrow, Wednesday, May 12th, 5.30 p.m. for our monthly interfaith meditation. We'll be blessed to have with us uh, Soto Zen priest Shokichi Kerrigan, who will be joining us from Brooklyn, New York. So we're very grateful for her presence with us. Again, that'll be next Wednesday at 5.30, um, which is May 12th always the second Wednesday of the month, and you'll get that. If you're signed up for our e-newsletters, you'll get the Zoom link for that. So we hope that you'll join us for that and for other upcoming events. So as we close today, just invite you to take a moment to notice what's happening in your body. What you heard today, what you said today, how is that reverberating within you? Just take a moment to notice what's in your heart and your being right here and now. Perhaps it's about the gifts that you have to offer and your spheres of influence in which you offer them. Perhaps it's about the boundaries of life, 
the fragility of life that creates an opening for the joy that is always present to sustain us. Or perhaps it's about the impartial kindness that we're able to exude and cultivate for ourselves and for all beings, this kindness. Life is a meta practice. And how you can live this day by day in your own life. This is where we go from here. May these blessings continue to be with you and nourish you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a presence of love and light and joy in our world and engaging the suffering, the impermanence, the injustice from your own spiritual roots, truth, and being. So I invite you as we close just to um, take a look around the room and we'll just invite you to, um, if you wish to wave to everybody, um, also feel free to, we can unmute ourselves, but at least for to, to wave to each other and do our thank yous and our goodbyes. And uh, we hope to see you again very soon. Much love and gratitude to all of you.